Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, welcome to the Central Library and this year's exciting Lowell Lecture Series, Gateway to Reading. I'm Beth Prindle, Manager of Exhibitions and Programming. We would first like to thank the Lowell Institute for their generous and continued sponsorship of this series. Since its inception in 1836, the Lowell Institute has been supporting speaker series in many institutions with a mission to make great ideas accessible to all people free of charge. I hope you got a copy of this year's series booklet. Could someone wave it around so you can see what it looks like? If you didn't get that, please make sure you do on the way. It is a fantastic lineup this year. The library would also like to thank the Boston Public Library Foundation, which provides funding for programs such as this for all ages, expanded resources for the library system, restored and improved spaces, and all in the name of advancement of learning. So this year's series, Gateway to Reading, explores the fundamental importance of childhood literacy and addresses the joys, discoveries, questions, and challenges facing today's generations of young readers and those who write and illustrate for them. The series is particularly timely as a major renovation of the Central Library in Copley Square is underway directly upstairs. The heart of our project is dedicated to expanding and reimagining the children and teen spaces. We pioneered the first dedicated children's room in the country right here in Copley Square, and we're excited to build on that legacy and make some new history in our mission connecting kids with a larger world of books, reading, and ideas. So we have a few housekeeping notes for you. Um, if you could please silence your cell phones and electronic devices or anything that might go beep, it would be very much appreciated. Um, all lectures are videotaped and will be made available on the library's website at www.bpl.org slash Lowell. Finally, um, we will have a book sale and author signing immediately following the talk outside the lecture hall here. So I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Megan Lambert. She's an instructor with the Center for Study of Children's Literature at Simmons College, where she teaches both here in Boston and in the satellite graduate programs at the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art. Previously, she worked in the Carl's Education Department for nearly 10 years. And tonight's speaker is one of the most influential and beloved children's book authors of all time. He is an architect and planner, professor emeritus of design at Hampshire College, and the author of a number of highly acclaimed children's books. His classic, The Phantom Tollbooth, marked its 50th anniversary in 2011 and has sold close to 4 million copies since its publication, and I think a few more tonight outside in the front lobby. <laughs> He's also penned a number of other highly acclaimed children's books, including The Dot in the Line, which was made into an Academy Award-winning animated film, and the recent Hello, Goodbye Window, which was awarded a Caldecott Medal. A self-described amateur cook and professional eater, he lives with his wife in Amherst, Massachusetts. It is my great pleasure and very great honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Norton Jester. You forgot to mention I make pickles, too. <laughs> and a good cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, actually, I went to Norton's house recently to have coffee with him to talk about this program, um, and we ended up having a really lovely conversation, and I hope that's what tonight ends up feeling like, um, not only between me and Norton, but between Norton and all of you as well. Um, so we will leave time for questions um, at the end, but when we spoke earlier this week about tonight's event, Norton said, do you think I could read to them? And I said, absolutely. So I'm going to stop talking for a moment, and I'm going to turn the program mm -hmm. over to Norton so that he can share some of his work with you. Thank you. Uh, I thought I'd start a little bit with one of the most important influences on my life as a writer, and that is wordplay and where it came from and how I got hooked on it. And uh, one of the great influences in my life in many things, but especially in writing, outside of the Marx Brothers, who I grew up at the perfect time when all their films were being released, and a, and a radio entertainer by the name of Colonel Lemu Lemuel Q. Stupnagel, which I'm sure none of you have ever heard of, because he, he was on the radio in the 1940s, who did um, recast stories into spoonerisms. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that, where the words and even the structure of the sentences are, are changed. And what you get, like with the Marx Brothers, is... You can call it nonsense, or after you've heard it several times, you realize 
There's something wonderful going on there. Anyway, my, my father, who was a very quiet, kind, gentle man, uh, had a wonderful sense of humor, but not in the ha-ha guffaw sense, but in the sense that he would sneak things up on you, and very, very quietly. Uh, as an example, uh, I would come in, and I remember this one specifically. I'd come in one day, and he would look up and say, Aha, I see you're coming early since lately. You used to be behind before, but now you're first at last. <laughs> Completely befuddled. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> And he knew it. He got up, came over, put his arm around me and said, you're a good kid and I'd like to see you get ahead. You need one. <laughs> and this went on every day. I mean, they were, they were all different ones, you know. And out of nowhere, he would come up, apropos of nothing, and say, if I give you a cow, will you give me a bag of beans? Well, anyone who knows Jack and the Beanstalk is fine. I didn't. And like most kids at a, at a young age, the normal reaction to punning and wordplay is, Ugh. because you don't get it and you don't know how to do it. But after a while, I would start to have that reaction, I understand that and I can do that. And then life got to be a lot more fun. I remember him one day, one day at the beach, it was very weighty, very uh, wavy kind of beach and with a lot of action in the water. And I was very hesitant about going in, and I was feeling very ashamed that I was hesitant about going in. And he looked at me very solicitously and said, just remember, he also surfs who only stands and wades. And I'll never forget it, and it was so wonderful. <laughs> but anyway, so I thought what I'd start would, would uh, be to read you a couple of selections. There happened to be three short ones from the Phantom Soul book that got, that got me going because... I discovered as a writer, I simply could not sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write something, and it's going to start here, and it's going to end here, and it's going to go in a straight line. I would just do bits and pieces, and a lot of them were generated from a lot of the idea of the wordplay and the puns, and I realized later that for kids, this was a wonderful thing because it so expanded their way of understanding or thinking about things. And it's also, if you really think about it, just the way that poets work. Because I read a lot of poetry, and I would say very conservatively, about 85% of what I read, I don't know what it means. <laughs> but I love the language, and I love the use of words, and I can get by on that you know, perfectly well, because you, you get a whole different way of looking at things. But let me, I picked these out here, so I'll just get them all set. Okay, this first one is that my, are any, or some of you, I guess, I hope are familiar with the book, The Phantom Soul Book. I hope. Uh, but he is, he's traveling uh, in his way to get to both Dig Dictionopolis and Digitopolis. And he's traveling with the, the um, watchdog and, uh, and, the, and the bug. And they're going through a very beautiful part of the country, and he stops to look at the view. And he says, isn't it beautiful? Oh, I don't know, answered a strange voice. It's all in the way you look at things. I beg your pardon, said Milo, for he didn't see who had spoken. I said, it's all in how you look at things. Milo turned around and found himself staring at two very neatly polished brown shoes. So standing directly in front of him, if you can use the word standing for anyone suspended in midair, was another boy just about his age whose feet were easily three feet off the ground. How do you manage to stand up there, asked Milo, for this was the subject he was most interested in. I was about to ask you a similar question, answered the boy, for you must be very much older, very much older than you look to be standing on the ground. What do you mean, Milo asked. Well, said the boy, in my family, everyone is born in the air with his head at exactly the height it's going to be when he's an adult, and then when we all grow towards the ground, uh, we're fully grown up, or as you can see, grown down. Our feet finally touch. Of course, there are a few of us whose feet never reach the ground, no matter how old we get, but I su suppose it's the same in every family. <laughs> he hopped a few steps in the air and skipped back to where he started and began again. You certainly must be very old to have reached the ground already. Oh, no, said Milo seriously. In my family, we all start on the ground and grow up, and we never know how far until we get there. 
What a silly system, the boy laughed. <laughs> then your head keeps changing its height, and you always see things in a different way. Why, when you're 15, things won't look at all like they did when you were 10, and at 20, everything will change again. I suppose so, replied Milo, for he'd never really thought about it that way. We always see things from the same angle, the boy continued. It's much less trouble that way. Besides, it makes much, much more sense to grow down and not up. When you're very young, you can never hurt yourself falling down if you're in midair. And you certainly can't get into trouble for scuffing up your shoes or marking the floor if there's nothing to scuff them on and the floor is three feet away. How do you know all that, asked Milo. Simple, he said proudly. I'm Alec Bings. I see through things. I can see whatever is inside, behind, around, covered by, or subsequent to anything else. In fact, the only thing I can't see is whatever, hap is whatever is happening right in front of my nose. Isn't that a little, a little inconvenient, asked Milo? It is a little, replied Alec, but it's quite important to know what lies behind things, and the family helps me take care of the rest. My father sees to things. My mother looks after things. My brother sees beyond things. My uncle sees the other side of every question, and my little sister Alice sees under things. How can she see under things when she's all the way up there, growled the humbug. Well, added Alec, whatever she can't see under, she overlooks. <laughs> <laughs> Could I ask you a question about sure. that? Sure, oh yeah. So when we met, um, we were talking about the stories behind the story, yeah. speaking of seeing behind things, and you told me the story about the odious ogre and that that was um, a story that had its roots in your childhood. Oh, yes. And I wonder if you would tell us about that and then maybe talk about your collaborations with Jules Pfeiffer a little oh, bit. Oh, I can do that too. Excellent. Uh, I can, can I go back to the last two of these? Of course you can. <laughs> okay. I, w when I was a kid, I guess eight or nine years old, my parents got it into their heads that they should send me to a summer camp. I'd learn a great deal from summer camp. Uh, I had no thoughts on it whatsoever. Anyway, they sent me off to a summer camp that some friend of theirs had recommended. And what the friend didn't tell them was that it was su summer camp for um, kids from the Lower East Side who had emotional and other kinds of problems. Uh, I arrived there, and uh, as the, there was a line in one of the Woody Allen movies or something about being beaten up by kids of every race, creed, and whatever you, whatever you want to, you want to describe. I really got pounded around. And we used to go on hikes occasionally, and they, we had one bunk bully. He would occasionally, when, when something was happening and we were in a group, he'd stand up and challenge anybody to take him on. And he did that one day when we were out, and I, I don't know why it happened to me, but I, got, I was, felt terribly humiliated by the whole thing that no one would stand up to him. So the next thing I knew, I was standing up in front of him. And he did just what everybody expected he would do. He wiped up the ground with me. <laughs> and uh, I thought about it for years later, and I said, there must be other ways to deal with a bully. And I, I sketched a little story out before I even was sort of actively writing and put it away. And every year or so, I'd take it out and try it and it didn't work, or I didn't get this. And then one day, I took it out, and it all worked. And I started with it, and that was the beginning of, of that story of uh, the little girl who, I don't know whether any of you read this, but it's a kind of fun story, who takes him on and, and defeats him with care and, and understanding and, and good spirit. <laughs> and uh, I, it's a kind of thing that just made me feel, feel good to be able finally to express all that frustration that I went through in a way that there was another way to deal with those things. So. And that was the second collaboration with Jules Pfeiffer. Uh, yeah, did. that was. Jules and I did the Phantom Tollbooth. We can talk about that a little later. And then 50 years, almost 50 years later, we did the Odious Ogre. And it went so well that we have a pact now, Jules and I. We're going to do another book every 50 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he's marvelous to work with. Uh, Jules, because he, someone once described him as the only artist that they knew who could draw an idea, and he re he really was. Anyway, let me get back to this for a minute. Uh, you can see how well organized I am.
Oh, yes. Um, there's a section in the later part of the book where Milo is visiting uh, Digitopolis, a kingdom of numbers. And they arrive, he and the humbug and the, and Milo, and, uh, the dog, talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> And they arrive, and the, uh, the mathematician who was there says to them, uh, perhaps you'd care for something to eat. Yes, sir, said Milo, who was beside himself with hunger. Thank you, added Tuck. Let's see, where am I? I missed something here. Okay. And they, and they served them a dish, and they served them one dish after the other. They kept eating it because it was wonderful. And then, how very strange, thought Milo, as he finished his seventh helping. Each one I eat makes me a little hungrier. Do have some more, suggested the math magician, and they continued to eat just as fast as they, ever, anyone could fill the bowls. After Milo had eaten nine portions, Tock 11, and the humbug, without one stopping to look up, 23, <laughs> the math magician blew his whistle, and for a second time, the pot was removed, and all the miners returned to work. These were the miners who worked, in, they, they mined the numbers in this big number mine they had. Ugh, gasped Tock, suddenly realizing that he was uh, 11 times hungrier than he started. I think I'm starving. Me too, complained Milo, whose stomach felt as empty as it could imagine, and I ate so much. Yes, it was, it was delicious, wasn't it? Asked the mathematician. It's the specialty of the kingdom. Subtractions do. <laughs> I have more of an appetite than when I began, said Tock. Certainly, replied the mathematician. The more you eat, the hungrier you get. Everyone knows that. They do, said Milo. And how do you ever get enough? Enough, he said impatiently. Here in Digitopolis, we have our meals when we're full and eat until we're hungry. That way, when you don't have anything at all, you have more than enough. <laughs> but don't worry, you'll soon be full again. It's completely logical, explained the dodecahedron. That's another character in the story. The more you want, the less you get. And the less you get, the more you have. Simple arithmetic. That's all, that's all supposed... That's all, okay. Suppose you had something and added something to it. What would you have? More, said Milo. Correct, he nodded. Now, suppose you have something and add nothing to it. What would you have? The same, he answered again, without much conviction. Splendid cried the dodecahedron. And suppose you have something and added less than nothing to it. What would you have then? Famine, roared the humbug, <laughs> who suddenly realized that was exactly what he'd eaten 23 bowls of. <laughs> but each, each one of these little things got me going on looking at something that was very ordinary in life and seeing if you could find a totally opposite way of thinking about it. And the last one, which is, I, is my favorite thing in the book, it's... Uh, it's, it's with a, a character in the book called the Dirty Bird. And there, the three of them are climbing up this absolutely deathly kind of climb up, up a mountain to rescue Rhyme and Reason, who's uh, in the castle in the air. And, uh, and it's, it's a stormy night. It's very dark. The wind is howling. They don't know what to do. And, and, and Milo says, I can hardly see a thing. We're looking for a place to spend the night. Whoops. Uh-oh. It's not yours to spend, a bird shrieked and followed <laughs> it with a horrible laugh. That doesn't make any sense, you see, he started to explain. Dollars or cents, it's still not yours to spend, the bird replied. What I didn't mean, insisted Milo. Of course you're mean, interrupted the bird. Anyone who'd spend a night that doesn't belong to him is very mean. Well, I thought that by... He tried again desperately. That's a different story, interjected the bird. If you want to buy, I'm sure I can arrange to sell. But with what you're doing, you'll probably end up in a cell anyway. You can see where the word played. <laughs> it begins to have an effect. That doesn't seem right, said Milo helplessly, for with the bird taking everything the wrong way, he hardly knew what he was saying. Agree, said the bird with a sharp click of his beak, but neither is it left. Although if I were you, I would have left a long time ago. Let me try once more, he said in an effort to explain. In other words, you mean you have other words, cried the bird happily? Well, by all means, use them. You're certainly not doing very well with the ones you have. <laughs> 
must you always interrupt like that to talk irritably? And he was, even he was becoming impatient. Naturally, he cackled, it's my job. I take the words right out of your mouth. And he leaned all the way forward and gave a terrible knowing smile. Is everyone who lives in ignorance like you? Asked Milo, they, I failed to mention they're climbing in the mountains of ignorance. Much worse, he said longingly, but I don't live here. I'm from a place far away called Context. <laughs> don't you think you should be getting back, suggested the bug. What a horrible thought, the bird shuddered. It's such an unpleasant place that I spend almost all of my time out of it. <laughs> Besides, what could be nicer than these grimy mountains? Almost anything, thought Milo as he pulled his collar up. And then he asked the bird, are you a demon? I'm afraid not, he replied sadly, as several filthy tears rolled down his beak. I've tried, but the best I can manage to be is a nuisance. And before Milo could reply, he flapped his dingy wings and flew off in a cascade of dust and dirt and fuzz. Wait, said Milo, who thought of several more things he wanted to ask. Thirty-four pounds, shrieked the bird as he disappeared into the fog. <laughs> anyway, you can see... You can see it's an incurable disease, but it leads to a lot of things. I find when I begin writing anything, I just keep a notebook and I go on long walks and I jot stuff down. And when I come back, I usually have 20, 30 pages of which about 18 are junk. But every once in a while, there's something where you look at something in a way that makes you understand it or be able to deal with it in a very different way. And when I have all these pieces, I somehow look at it and said, somewhere in there is a good story. <laughs> but never, it's never from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sorry, I took up too much time. No, <laughs> that's why we're here, for you to take up time. Uh, it's not mine to spend, right? <laughs> um, so... When we met, we talked about your process and you told me about those notebooks where you would jot down ideas and then something would come from them. And you also said that you're not just jotting down words, that you're sketching and you're drawing pictures as well because you see yourself as a very visual person. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit sure. about that strength yeah. and how that informs your writing and then how you reconcile that with the fact that other people are illustrating your words in most of your books. <laughs> well, it might be useful to start out with, this, with knowing that I never intended to be a writer. I had no interest in being a writer. I was going to be an architect. My father was an architect. My brother had just finished architectural school. I loved to make things. All my toys were the things that my father brought home from the office, the samples, the leftover things. And I was very pleased. I went off to college, and I finished architectural school in five years, which it was at, the, at that time, and I, I received a, a Fulbright scholarship and went off to England for a year and a half, which is a very strange place. I was there for, before, for must have been at least three or four months before I realized bloody yank was two words. <laughs> uh, anyway, I stayed there, and when I finished, I had to go into service, because at that time, which was in the early 50s, we had universal military training. You just had to go in. So I went into the Navy, and uh, as you know, when you're stationed anywhere, you, about a third of your time is spent actively doing things. The rest of it, you're bored out of your mind. And so I began, I always carried a sketchbook with me. I love, and I'm a very visual person. Uh, so I always did, I began doing little drawings of castles and fairies and princesses and knights and all kinds of things. And I'd hang them up to dry. And we lived on a little on a boat that was converted for a, a, a barrack. And uh, I would pin them up, and I was doing fine. I was very happy. I'd write a few lines on them. And then I got called into the captain's office, and he announced to me that Navy men that didn't draw pictures of fairies and castles <laughs> and, and elves and things like that, so I was forbidden to do any more of that. And, uh, and by the time... I stopped. By the time I got home, I started again. I had heard that the Ford Foundation was awarding grants uh, in various fields. And I got, while I was in England, I got very interested in uh, city planning and the way cities are lived in. And I thought it would be a, a nice thing to do, maybe a little book or pamphlet or whatever it was for kids on how you lived in cities and how they became cities, how they achieved the form that they have, how they influenced your life. 
And I didn't think I stood a chance. And uh, there's an old saying that uh, when God wants to punish you, he grants your wishes. <laughs> and, uh, and so I received a, a Ford grant to do a book on cities for kids. And I started in, and I realized very quickly I really wasn't ready to do that yet. I was very ambitious, and I simply hadn't done enough in the field itself to really uh, do it well. So I decided I was going to try to find a way to avoid doing that. And I, I went away on vacation, visited some friends who had a beach house, took long walks, and began to think about my own life as a kid and the strangeness of it and all the oddball things that I did and believed and got into trouble with. And I never stopped. It just kept going. I was a sort of person. I mean, Milo was me at that time. And uh, I never got back to the book on, on cities. And when the, there was a book written a couple of years ago called uh, The Annotated Phantom Toll Booth. I told this story to the guy who was writing it. And he contacted the Ford Foundation. I thought, my God, they're going to send 10 policemen and arrest me. And that would be the end of that. But they were delighted, and they told him the whole story, and they followed it, and they knew the book. And I was just very pleased, and I, I got the, the feeling that any grant should be given just to give you the time to think about what you wanted to do. But, and one of the things that I do now is, and it's a motivation for most of the things that I do, is I'll think about something, and I'll get started on it, and then I'll say, I don't want to do that. And so I look for something to do to avoid doing what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> and that's how a lot of my books have, have gotten written. So. Mm -hmm. And how did um, Jules Pfeiffer, can you talk a little bit about oh, how he yes, came I to should. illustrate? I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, when I was in the Navy, my last stationing was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And um, they gave me a choice. I could live on the, on, the, in, on the yard in some dreadful places, or they would give me an allowance and I could rent a place for myself. I remember what they gave me. $77.10. I'll never forget that figure. <clears throat> so I went over to Brooklyn Heights, which is a nice residential area in part, and I, find a, I found a basement apartment. Very grungy, terrible place. Didn't even have its own bath. That was down a hallway. And uh, what I didn't know was Jules lived on the second floor. And we got to know each other. And uh, Jules claims we met when we were both putting out garbage. I claimed that we met when I was putting out garbage and he was looking for something to eat. <laughs> but it was something like that, however it went. And then three of us, and another friend of ours, uh, joined us and we rented a rundown uh, duplex apartment in the south end of Brooklyn Heights, which was not being rehabilitated terribly well. And we moved in. And I was working on the Phantom Toll booth, and Jules had just his career was just getting underway, and it was very successfully. And I would re read him sometimes sections of the, what I was writing, or sometimes he'd just pick them up and walk off of them. And, uh, and they were marvelous, absolutely marvelous, the illustrations. One thing in publishing that they always warn you about, you never submit a book with the illustrations, because the publisher or the editor always wants to do, that's a world they want to take care of themselves. But these were so good, you couldn't, really do it any other way. But Jules and I had, had problems, you know, when we were, because there are certain things he didn't like to draw. I've always wanted to have, if I did a book at all, I wanted to have maps in it, especially on the end pages, because when I had kids' books, they all had maps. Jules wouldn't draw any maps. He couldn't. If you've ever driven with him, you know why. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I had to draw the map, and then he put a piece of paper over it and traced it and did it. And, and another part of the book, I had the armies of uh, wisdom, uh, so, so they were called, uh, all on horseback going off to rescue rhyme and reason. And he didn't like to draw horses. And so he came to me one day and said, would I mind if you put the army on cats? <laughs> he didn't mind drawing cats. Uh, but that thing was going on. I would make up things after a while, but I knew he couldn't draw <laughs> anyway. And he would try to get back and subvert me until I one day en ended up inventing three demons with the triple demons of compromise. One was short and fat, one was tall and thin, and the third was exactly like the other two, <laughs> which I knew he couldn't draw. And so he got his revenge. I think it's about on page 18 of the book or something like that. 
He drew a picture of me as the weatherman so. <laughs> in a toga. I don't wear a toga. <laughs> <laughs> but he was very excited to um, create the pictures for the Odeon. Oh, Ogre, and right? they were absolutely wonderful. And the book had been out about five or six years. The publisher came and said, we want to put out a special edition with all new illustrations. I said, no, you don't, because these are the illustrations. Mm -hmm. And the, I can't think of anybody who could do, have done it better than he did. Mm -hmm. Now, some other artists who've um, worked with your books are Chris Roshka and G. Brian Karras and yeah. Eric Carle back in 1982. Yeah. Um, you had such a collaborative process with Jules Pfeiffer. How much collaboration came into these other books, or well, was that more of a... What I discovered very early on is you don't have a collaborative process with an illustrator. Um, you, we'd sit down and we'd talk about it. You know, I'd tell them what I was thinking or what I felt was the spirit of the story or anything like that. <coughs> Excuse me, anything that came into my mind. And then he goes off, or he or she, or whoever, go off on their own and do it. And it, it's the first few times it was terrifying mm -hmm. to me because you don't know what's going to happen. But invariably, if you choose properly, and it's all by instinct, you don't know for sure, it really works. Chris Rashka... Uh, is a brilliant illustrator, and he's so original, he will try anything, and you never know what you're going to get, and I was completely unsure when, I, when we started on the Hello Goodbye window, the one that won the, the Caldecott, but he, he, was, he did it absolutely brilliantly. It was wonderful, you know, what he did. Eric and I worked on a little wordplay book that we did, and uh, he did a the first one job he did, I thought, was absolutely wonderful. Took it to the publisher, and they talked him out of it because they didn't mm. like it. And he didn't have to because he had, at that time, even a lot of power. He could have done it. And, uh, and it came out, and, and it didn't do well because he talked himself out of the, the good things that he had done. Who was the third one you mentioned? Um, oh. G. Brian Karras, okay. who did yeah. Neville. Karras did the, uh, yeah, a Neville. That's the last book I did, mm -hmm. I did not the last, but the last one I've done. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I wasn't, when I saw other books of his, I wasn't quite sure, because I think most writers do this. You have a, a very blurry image in your mind of what you think that book should look like. You don't know how to do it. You can't do it yourself. And when you see work by other people, you're never really quite sure they, they're going to get it the way you think. And in each one of the cases, those last three we talked about, they came out very differently than what I would have expected. And I was so glad I did it that way. Yeah. Now, um, you spoke a little bit about the editorial process of an art, art director, and editor, telling Eric Carl mm -hmm. something that you ultimately thought wasn't good advice. Um, but you have told me about your work with Jason Epstein um, when you were working on Phantom mm -hmm. Tollbooth and that he would often say to you, it's your book. Oh, yeah. um, and if you could talk a little bit about what that meant to you as a young yeah. writer when he said it's your book, both in terms of creative freedom and also responsibility. Yeah. Eric, I mean, Jason, I don't know whether many of you, that name is familiar to you, Jason Epstein. He was the... Uh, the chief editor at Random House for many years, absolutely wonderful editor. And he started the whole quality paperback revolution in this country. He now, he initiated and it still runs the, um, um, what is it, American Library, I forget what the exact title of it is, where they, they re put out books on, on American, important American authors. It's a terrific set of books. Uh, and he was the kind of editor contrary to many of them who sit there and tell you what they think they want you to do. We would discuss things, and he would make all kinds of suggestions or raise all kinds of questions. <clears throat> and sometimes, most of the time, I'd, we didn't always agree on, on a thing. We always talked about it, and he used to tell me, he said, when I make a suggestion, you go away with it, it comes back, it's not what I suggested. It's not what you talked about. It's something different. And it works. And that will always very please me. But there were a few times when I was adamant about it. And I wouldn't, there was things, one thing in the book, which is the colorful symphony where the Milo conducts the dawn. It's one of my favorite parts of the book. He didn't want in there. And his argument was a, was a logical one. And that it, it didn't 
propel a plot line through very well, but I still liked it very much. And we argued and argued, and then he, he told me what you just said. He said, well, <coughs> it's your book. <laughs> I was terrified. Because here's one of the best editors in New York, you know, very famous, very, you know, well-known by everybody, produced wonderful books, and I'm saying to myself, what the hell are you doing telling him what we should be doing? But I held my, my own on that, and he respected that. And there are very few editors that I've come across who will have that kind of interplay with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's wonderful because they are raising questions, and out of it, if you work together well, something better often comes out. There are many authors who will say, this is what I want you to change here. This is the way this should be said. This is the way... And I find that's a very uh, unsuccessful uh, mm -hmm. way to deal with things. You know. So you've told us that Neville is not your last book. Um, when we met, you talked a little bit about ideas that are kicking around, and you told me about a Norwegian cabinet maker uh, yes. and the lesson he taught you. Um, and I wondered if you would share that. Well, with I don't like to uh, talk too much about it, but a little okay. bit I will. Uh, when I was... This was in the mid-1930s. God, I'm old. <laughs> and we lived in a street that was in Brooklyn, East 9th Street. And it was a time, the height of the, of the Depression. There were a lot of people who were homeless. There was almost no uh, social support network in the country at that time. So a lot of people were on the street. A lot of people didn't have any place to go or things to do. And they were all around, all around on the streets. And they even had a little code. Uh, they all carried pieces of chalk. And when you walked along the ground at the edge of the sidewalk, there would be little things noted in this little code that they had that would say, you can get a meal here, or they will let you work for something, or watch out for this place, stay away from here. And they, all, they knew. They had every sort of neighborhood sort of identified for what, for what you could do. My father, who I said was an architect, had somehow gotten to know this man, Mr. Brinkman. He was quite old by then, uh, probably almost as old as I am now. And he was a carpenter, and a brilliant, brilliant carpenter. Uh, he was the kind of person, if he put together two pieces of wood, you couldn't see where they joined. They were, it was so good. And he was, uh, worked as a handyman around, around the neighborhood, and for some unaccountable reason, he took a liking to me. And my father had given him a little place in our basement where there used to be a coal bin. And he made it into a workshop for himself. And he used to let me go down and watch him work. And it wasn't too long before I realized that he was what he did. That was his identity. That was his uh, reason for life. Whatever he did, he did the best possible way. And it was wonderful work. And he couldn't do it any other way. And it was a thing that even to this day, even through writing or architecture or whatever it was, has influenced my life. Because I know that's the only way, you know, you, could, you can work. That you, you have to be able to throw yourself into it that way. Well, one day, he, it was several years that he was doing this. And then one day he was not there anymore. And uh, my father was quite concerned. He contacted the police and the hospitals and everything. We never never found them again. But, and so I inherited Mr. Brinkman's tools. I still have many of them. And uh, I can't take one of them out without that whole thing coming back to me exactly you know, as it was. And I think it, it's a lesson, if we can teach any kind of a lesson, especially to kids today, it's that way. What you do, you do the best possible thing you can do and it doesn't matter if it's success or failure because that failure has more inherent gain in it than anything you do in an offhand way, and it's mm -hmm. successful. So mm -hmm. anyway, I, I want to do a... It seems like a strange thing to do, but it's a kind of a, uh, an eight-year-old's memoir mm -hmm. <laughs> of Mr. Brinkman. Mm -hmm. um, in 2011, when the Phantom Tollbooth celebrated its 50th anniversary, um, Adam Gopnik wrote an essay about it in right. The New Yorker, and he distilled the message of the book. If Mr. Brinkman had a message for you, um, Adam Gopnik distilled the message of The Phantom Tollbooth to this sentence, that learning isn't a set of things we know, but a world that we enter. And um, 
as you think about writing and creating stories or worlds for children to enter in your books, um, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about um, Sourpuss and Sweetie Pie and the Hello Goodbye window, <laughs> which you were thinking of a particular child in creating that. Yes, those my books. granddaughter. And uh, she used to come over and spend, she had, her mother's a single parent, and uh, Tori would come over and stay with us a lot and uh, didn't think much of it. We had a lot of fun. We did a lot of things. And then one day suddenly something happened, and I said, all of that stuff I'm seeing or doing with her is so wonderful. There has to be a way to put it down, to make it visible. So, and I realized that w there was not a coherent story there. There was just the events and my relationship. So I tried to put it together. Well, I started, and I started to write on it, and I kept going for a while, and I stopped, and I thought it was pretty good writing. Then I looked at it and said, no, it can't be that way. What I'm writing, I'm writing from my point of view. What the, it has to be in her voice, mm -hmm. and it has to be her speaking and describing all of these things. So I went all the way back, got rid of everything, and started again. And uh, it was a wonderful lesson for me as a writer because understanding the voice of any story, you know, where it's coming from, what, what, what is influencing the emotions, the actions, everything, has to be true and has to be right. It's not, you can convince yourself that you're writing brilliantly, but you're not if you're not doing that, finding the way to tell it. So I had, a, I had the, the, the Hello Goodbye window, uh, which she still has a gripe with me because when we moved, uh, they offered us the window. They were going to change it. I didn't take it. Mm. And she is beside herself with <laughs> not having the window. But um, it was a wonderful experience, a very rich experience, not, not just for the book, but in our relationship, you know, mm -hmm. too. So. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one thing which I, I could mention. I, how are we doing on our time? Are we? Not sure. Um, we're good. Okay. I okay. want to be sure to leave time for questions. Someone yeah. is going to. But I want. Sorry. I, I talk a lot at schools and things. Oh. Well, we'll let Norton finish this story. Yeah, then this is going to take a, a few minutes. So, okay. but I think it's important, <laughs> and it relates to a lot of things that we're talking about. Um, again and again, I run into kids who have a hard time and especially in elementary schools. Why do I have to learn this? I'm never going to use it. What is it? How do you learn things? It's a very puzzling kind of thing. They don't know why all this is being inflicted you know, on them. Uh, and I was talking at one school, and there were a lot of usual questions that were coming out. Where do you get your ideas from? Uh, how did you come up with this? Or how much money do you make? <laughs> Which is a question that comes up a lot. <laughs> and... Uh, and then a little boy, who seemed to be smaller than the other kids in the class, got up and asked me a question that encompassed all of these things I was just talking about. Why did he have to go to school? Why were they teaching certain things? Would, he wouldn't ever use this. He wouldn't ever use that. Why did he have to take this? How did the whole idea, the mystique of education, work? He absolutely floored me. I didn't know how to even begin. Uh, but I, I said, I have to try. I have to, I have to answer this. So I said, well, think about it this way. In your early life, you come across a great many things. They're facts, they're pieces of information, they're observations, they're a whole bunch of things. But they connect to nothing. They're just there. As if you put one here and one here and one here. After a while, you'd have thousands of these little things that don't seem to relate to anything. And then at a certain point in your life, you look at all these stuff that's floating around and you say, hey, this over here somehow connects to that. And this connects to this. And by the time you start with this, it's never ending. You have all of these things connected. And I said, and that's the work of your life, to do that. He looked at me for a minute and said, and then what happens? <laughs> and I had sort of said it in a way where the answer seemed very obvious to me, but it was very wrong for him. I said, and then you die. <laughs> and I didn't mean you die. <laughs> what I really meant, and I said it the wrong way, was that that is the whole uh, activity of your life. If you're not doing that and making these connections and finding out how all these things are useful or important to your life, then in a sense you do seek, uh, cease 
you know, to live. I didn't know whether anybody, and, and talk about silence, there was this deadly <laughs> silence, silence after that. The teachers were looking grimly at me. <laughs> and uh, it just, I don't know whether any of them understood or didn't, but it carried with it, you know, another lesson. I, I taught for 32 years, and uh, mostly at, at a college level, but uh, many ways it wasn't, it wasn't very different. And I learned one very important thing. What I'm teaching, or think I'm teaching, and what they're learning, or think they're learning, rarely coincides. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't come with any time constraints on them either, because I would bump at the students three weeks later, a month later, two months later, sometimes years, who would come up to me and say, you know what you're talking about at such and such a time? I think I'm finally beginning to understand that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's it. Those are those connections that begin, that begin to happen. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's an episode, really, that I can't forget because it's so moving and so important that that's what our job is when we're teaching. Not to deal with the facts or the dates or whatever it was. Who cares? It's the, it's the deal with the connections and let the other stuff fall into place, you know, as it will. And that's because, to quote reason from your book, whenever you learn something new, the whole world becomes that much richer. It's a good line. Who are you quoting there? You. <laughs> you. Um, so you had said before we took the stage that you wanted to close with a story oh, of certain yes, spoonerism. Oh, yes, find it um, And then after he tells this story, um, and we have a good laugh, um, we're going to move into some time for questions from all of you. I've got to find this thing oh, first. Oh, sorry. Now, take a second. Okay. Take a second somewhere in here. It's, it's a story that started with this gentleman I, I cited to you first that nobody hold of. Colonel heard of called uh, Lemuel Q. Stupnagel, and he did these spoonerisms. And if I can find it here, whoops, I will I will do it for you. Oh no! My goodness, where did all this stuff go? I may not be able to find it. I thought I had it right here. Right. You should see my office. <laughs> <laughs> we can move into questions if you'd rather. Uh, okay, let's start it with that, and I'll find it while we're answering. Oh, okay. here it is. Oh, here it oh. is. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, he did, as I said, all these uh, stories which based on regular uh, fairy and folk tales. And uh, of all the famous ones, and uh, I got a book of his, and he had one in there that he did, the only one I didn't like, and I redid it myself. And uh, anyway, it's called Prinderella and the Synths. <clears throat> you know what that is, of course. Once upon a while, in a distant kingdom, there was a gritty little pearl named Prinderella, who lived with her two uh, sugly isters and her sticket wet mother, who made her pine the shots and shans and do all the other wordy dirk around the house. <laughs> well, one day the ping issued a proclamation ordering all the jellegible earls to the palace for a drancy fest ball. The sense was passing a tardy for all the people of the pan. The two sugly isters and the sticket wet mother were going, but Prinderella couldn't go because she didn't have a drancy fest. All she had was a pretty dag that didn't it. <laughs> Wasn't that a shirty dame? <laughs> well, along came the Prinderella's Gary Fodmother, who changed a pumpkin into a poach and some heist into morses and her pretty dag into a drancy fest and said, be sure to come back on the moke of Stridnight. So Prinderella bent to the wall and she pranced all night with a sense. On the moke of Strid night, she ran down the Stalus peps, and on the bottom pep, she slopped her dripper. <laughs> and Anne Array. The poor sins had even forgotten to ask the ninces her prame. 
Next day, the ping issued another proclamation, ordering all the people of the town to the palace to sly on the tripper. The two sugly isters and the stick at wet mother slide it on, and it didn't it. <laughs> but the Prinderella's finey toot fitted it. So on that very dame say, Prinderella and the synths mot garried and hived lappily ever after. Now there is a moral to the story that has guided my life since then, and I, I will give it to you with apologies because I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but it's simply, if the foo shits, wear it. <laughs> A little, a little postscript. The wor if you do enough of this, the world changes completely. You have a way, or you begin to develop a way of seeing things, or of expanding your meaning and understanding of things, or just recognizes the fun or the insanity. It's why I love the Marx Brothers so much. It was all completely insane until you saw it a few times and realized lurking in there were all kinds of new things that really enriched your life. Mm -hmm. New things and patterns and connections. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Mm -hmm. Questions? We will have two microphones um, running up uh, each side. So uh, Rebecca and I will be answering, uh, we'll be walking them up to you. And if we'll hand you the microphone, and then you, if you could just ask, ask the question. If you could give your questions fairly short so we can give um, some people some time, that would be great. Okay? So I'm going to head up here. Will you state your name and then your question? Um, I'm Jen Carla. I'm Jen Carla. And, um, what did that story mean? It didn't make any sense. <laughs> It meant that you're much smarter than we all thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it made its own sense. It didn't make a literal sense. I mean, nobody would write a story if you wanted everybody to understand it quite like that. But I don't think you can ever hear uh, Cinderella and the Prince again, reading it or having someone read it to you, and not think of this other way. <laughs> That's all I can tell you, I think, on that. Hi. Um, hi, my name is Melissa. I'm here. I'm trying to find oh, it's yeah. all right. You don't have to find me. So um, I won't gush for long, but I will say that it was your book blew my head off when I was six or seven. I first read it, and it, it launched me as a reader. It was the most, it is still the most sort of completely satisfying book I've ever read. So thank you. And I brought oh. my own, my childhood copy. <laughs> Um, would you talk a little bit about the terrible trivium who, who terrified me then and still does? Well, all of those demons were my demons as a kid and into an adult, being an adult. They were things that bothered me. I mean, the terrible trivium was, the, was that entity, whatever it was, whether it was a person or just an idea in your head, that was there to prevent you from doing what you wanted to do, you know, or should be doing. Each one of those was a certain aspect of my life or my neuroses or whatever you want to call them. And one of the things you try for in, in your life, you realize those things are never going to go completely away, but what you have to do is learn to live with them or to recognize often how ridiculous they are or you are for paying attention. And they give you, in a sense, a way to begin dealing with your life that way. And... Uh, when I finished the book, it's interesting. Uh, when we did the book as a, both a play and then a musical, what I did more was to put more of the demons into it because I wanted that to be more upfront than it was even in, in the book for, for that reason. We, we talk ourselves or we disable ourselves in a lot of ways by not dealing with those things. Hi, my name is Kim Myers. Over here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I got that light right in my eye. I can't see anything. My 17-year-old daughter asked me to tell you that your book changed her life. When she was 16 and she read it, it uh, helped her stop feeling so jaded 
<laughs> I didn't think she was jaded at 16. And it helped her to see simple things in a fresh way and make the world a much more yeah. wonderful place. So thank you. Well, I thank you. And, you know, it's interesting to me, um, I know from, from myself, I shy away from trying to lecture or preach or teach. I like to uncover things. And I find when I hear from them, I get a lot of mail from kids and everything, that they will describe to me things in the book that I didn't know were there. They seem to find a way to interpret it for their own pleasure and needs. And that is the greatest thrill I have. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to be doing lessons for kids. What I think works, if you can, is to open things up so they can begin to think and enjoy and look at things in different ways. Yeah. So I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you. So I actually have a question, which is, how do you keep your mind growing young? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I think one of the great advantages I've had is, is, is not uh, growing too old, in the sense, in the sense that uh, I think you really must carry more of the way you think as a child into your adulthood than a lot of people do. I think it's important not to lose the sense of that sense of wonder in many cases or that sense of not understanding or as was said a little while ago of saying this is ridiculous or I don't understand it because that keeps everything moving and that's, that's very important. Uh, I don't know, I have no formula for that but I was just, uh, you know, I, I had a very kind of odd growing up in, in that uh, I had a brother four and a half years older than I was, who was very bright, uh, with a wonderful personality, very good looking, very popular. I mean, everything you could describe. He was the kind of kid that when I was going through school and I would go into a class that he had been into several years before, the teacher would look at my name, hmm, Justin, oh yeah, we'll expect a lot from you. And you know how great that makes you feel. <laughs> but... Um, I, I, I just think that in my growing up, I, I inhabited a, a kind of very internal world. And uh, those things have just stuck. I don't know why, but they, they have. And that is a wonderful thing to have happen. I'm not saying you retain, you know, you, you're grown up as a child, but you, there are certain aspects of, of being a child that I think are important not to forget about. Hi, Mr. Juster. I'm way up top up here. On the right, there I am. Um, uh, my name is Karen, and my question is, do you have a favorite adaptation of The Phantom Tollbooth? I know it's been a film and lots and lots of theaters, and you were involved in an opera adaptation, and I wondered if you had a favorite. Well, I never liked the movie that was made, and I love the guy who made it. He's the same one who did The Dot and the Line, and we won an Academy Award, uh, Chuck Jones, who was a brilliant animator. But we had a funny uh, relationship in that <clears throat> Most of the time, when a, re a writer and a filmmaker get together, it's the writer who wants to retain, retain everything in the book, and it's the filmmaker who wants to open it up, spread it out, and do other things and, that are appropriate for a film, because the film is, is not a book. In our case, it was exactly the opposite. He so loved the book, he wanted to keep everything from the book in, and I kept saying, no, Chuck, you've got to open this up or change this or try this. And we, we never did really get together on it. And um, I'm, I'm glad that Dot and the Line turned out, you know, so well. Uh, I, there, let's see, there's a, there's a dramatic script that was done by a, a woman I know, a writer who lives, now lives in California. And uh, it's, it's different than I would have done, but I, I liked it and I respected it. Uh, I did, along with Sheldon Harnick, he was the man who did uh, the lyrics and some of the writing for uh, Fiddler on the Roof. The two of us did the, the libretto together for the stage musical, and I think that comes the closest, I think, to being successful. He was marvelous. So he could take some of the things that were in prose in the book and recast them as lyrics without missing a beat. You know, they sounded exactly the way they they belong. That's, I guess, I think that's the one I, I like the best of all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have a question up here. 
My name is Roberto. How did you get the idea for talk? How did I get the idea for talk? Well, there is a story with that. I had Milo, because Milo was me mostly, and so I had one character. And I said to myself, well, <coughs> when I was a kid, I used to come home from school at 3 o'clock and listen to radio broadcasts of stories. As a kid, they were 15-minute serials, and they would do things like uh, John, Don Winslow of the Navy or anything like that. But one they did was Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. And Jack Armstrong had a mentor, someone who would take care of him, who uh, watched over him, who would provide advice and support and strength, everything you could possibly want. And I said, that's the kind of a character I need for Milo, except it wasn't going to be Uncle Jim, who was the character in, in, uh, in, the, in the other story. And I thought about the idea of having a dog, a watchdog, and of course that led into all these other things with the watchdog. But then when I had when I had the dog, I said, well, that's somewhat unbalanced. He's got that perfect mentor, the perfect person to guide him and someone he can trust, someone who tells the truth, someone who can support him in any way possible. But that's not what life is all about. Life is also the other end of the spectrum. Hence, we have the humbug who you can't trust, who never tells the <laughs> truth, constantly gets you in trouble if you allow him to, and all of those things. And that's how that, that threesome sort of developed to go through the story. And it's kind of a nice thing because I didn't start with it. It just began to develop out of my thinking about it. Hello, I'm up here. Uh, my name is Joseph Smeal. I graduated from Amherst College a few years ago, and I once um, found you in town and had you sign my book right before I was about to go abroad. Um, wow. I sign, you, you probably don't remember, but you, <laughs> you signed the book for my grandmother, who's a retired school teacher, and I just wanted to echo a few sentiments that people have already said, um, because at the time when you signed my book, I was very jaded. And if you had made the comment about stories not necessarily needing to make sense to see the connections, because I was jaded, it would have made no sense to me. <laughs> but now, uh, five years later, um, it makes sense to me much more. And so for that, I wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, so we just have time for one last question, but I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for book signing, and you'll have, all have an opportunity to meet him. Um, but we have one final question. Um, I'm Dexter, and I was wondering how you came up with the idea for Officer Shrift. Well... <clears throat> Do you know the expression short shrift? Have you ever heard that expression? Short shrift. Well, it's an expression that you can probably find in the dictionary, and it means if you give someone short shrift, it means you level them, you punish them severely, you, you, you take care of them, you know what I mean? And so when I was looking for a policeman, I said, well, he's someone who's going to give Milo short shrift. But if he's short shrift, why, that, why can't that be his name? Uh, and it worked out very well. When I was a kid, I read books, and I loved, in some of them, the way the characters' names will tell you what the character is like. You know who does that very well? Dickens does that absolutely marvelously. <laughs> and so I, I thought about it that way. And there are a number of things, like uh, the, uh, the not-so-wicked witch, is, uh, and what was her name? Uh, Faintly Macabre. <laughs> which means slightly terrible. <laughs> and uh, I thought about the names in that way, trying to get them in some way so they described a little the character himself. Great. So if everyone could please give a big hand for our speaker. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. And please join us outside for an author signing and book sale. Thank you.